glad to have you in the studio, Sean Cruz. And Dr. Sean Cruz, and how are you today, my friend? Man, Mike, I'm great, and I'm very happy to be here and talking about some fun space stuff. We, we live in a day today where we are, we are doing astrophysics by collecting gravitational waves, which 150 years ago, there was no concept that those even existed. Exactly. We're, we're living in a day where we have walked on the surface of another world. When 150 years ago, we were still trying to figure out how far away the sun was. So to, yes, to think that's about, right. Right, it wasn't that long ago. But but when you think about the explosive growth of our knowledge about space in the last 150 years, it's really quite amazing, right? And so and so one of our topics today is is to talk about this this event that takes place right every once in a while where a planet crosses between us and the sun. Now, right. obviously, there's only two planets that can do this, unless it's a really bad day. So there's only two planets that can do this, and one of those is Mercury, right. and the other one is Venus. And that's because right. they're closer to the sun than we are. So right. they, they have the potential for everything to align just right where they pass directly in front of the disk of the sun as viewed from the Earth. We call that event a transit. Okay. And the reason we're talking about that today is because we have a transit coming up uh, within the next week as we're recording the show here. Oh, it's yeah. going to be on November the 11th, 2019. Okay. Got it. The planet Mercury is going to pass directly in front of the face of the sun. Oh, cool. And our team at the Space Science Center will be, you know, weather permitting, will be imaging yes. that event and sending it out to the world via our Facebook page and our web and our website. So we'll be doing an actual Facebook webcast of that event uh, sending images directly from our telescope to our Facebook page. And so folks who follow us on Facebook, or you can link to it from our website, you can go there and you can see uh, our images coming up from our observatory right here in Columbus, Georgia, of Mercury passing in front of the face of the sun. Man, that that is uh, pretty amazing. And I'll tell you what, in our notes, we'll put the uh, links in there so that people who are watching this video can uh, look down at the links and go directly to where we're talking about at the yeah. Coca-Cola Space Science Center. That's right. And if you happen to stumble onto this link after that event, after that date, We'll have archived images up on our website too, so you can go back and check those images out and okay. and and see it even even if it's past the eleventh. Very cool. You know, I know sometimes it rains, it gets cloudy down here. We're in a valley, after all. Um, and so here's a weird thought. I think you guys need your own satellite. You know, so you know a telescope mounted on a satellite just for the Coca-Cola Space Science Center. Am I going too far? No, not at all. I, I think that you should uh, you should uh, help me with that effort to try to fund our own satellite. So okay, that when it gets it a little here, rainy in Georgia, we could just cut to the satellite feed. All right, I did hear a rainy night in Georgia yesterday, so it might we may have something uh, going there. But uh, listen, I think it's going to be a great event. So. Uh, transverse. Yeah, so a transit. So Transit, so, excuse so, me. So the transits, and I think we have an image of the graphic of this particular transit coming up where we show the diagram of it passing in front of the face yeah, of the there sun. It is. Oh, uh, by the way, this is is this a shot of Mercury? This is, this one is Mercury right here. So okay, this is so a, a I, previous transit of Mercury. I want to say to any, uh, to any uh, flat Mercury or um, out there uh, <laughs> that uh, turns out that planets are uh, spherical. So uh, that's my, I'm sorry, that's my only contribution today to this. No, uh, well, that's an important one. Let's, <laughs> let's not minimize that contribution because if there are folks out there who think that planets are, I don't know what, Pancake shape. Well, Pancake I mean, I'm with a dome cubic, over it. You know, I don't know. Flat, there's there's all kinds of crazy ideas. Come on. But they are indeed spheres. Yes, and this And this is an earlier transit. So the transits of Mercury are rare, but not super rare. So they occur about every decade or so. Um, so about 13 times a century is a way oh, to okay. think about it. Okay. That's uh-huh. about how often they are. So so Mercury is one of those planets that lines up favorably to make multiple transits. Wow, this is and, a pretty big event then. It doesn't yeah, happen so that often, not that so often. let's pay attention yeah, to it's, it's, bit, it's Yeah, it's semi-rare, and that's why we're making kind of a big deal about it and showing it. Um, I, again, I think I have a graphic there that shows the actual line of it crossing the face. Uh, and a little yellow one there. There it is. Yeah, let me take a look at this, and we'll pull it up for uh, for our viewers to see. So we can see that that this particular transit's a really favorable one because the green dashed line is uh, is the is the line that where Mercury is crossing the sun. It's going right almost through the middle. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's a good long transit. It's going to be many. It's going to be several hours uh, in the making. About almost six hours, five and a half oh, hours. Really? Okay. Yeah, so a lot time. of time to get shots, uh, video, photos. 
et cetera. Exactly. So, so we're hoping, again, we're, we're looking at yes. our weather, yes, you know, a little right. bit long-term and we don't trust that this long-term, but it's going to show a few clouds out there. So we're hoping that sometime during that time, it'll break and we'll get some images of that event, but. And it's during the day. It is during the day, okay. right okay. here on the East coast. It starts Eastern standard time about seven thirty in the morning and it's going to finish up about one o'clock in the okay, afternoon. Okay. Just for the, the people who, um, like myself, uh, those dates and times go by real fast. Give us the date mm-hmm. and then the hours again one more time to see this trans, transit. transit. So it's it's November the 11th, 2019. That'd be Veterans Day. Okay. 2019. It's going to start at 7.35 a.m. and finish up at about 1.04 a.m. Okay. in the afternoon. Well, now that's specific. November enough. 11th. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll hold you to that. That was that's, that's very nice. And so that's, this is coming up. It doesn't happen uh, that often, but we, we, if, if the clouds and uh, weather mm-hmm. willing, then we'll get some really good shots right, of this. Right. Um, and we, 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 we see it as the, um, the, that ball that you first showed, the, yeah. the Mercury planet going across the sun. Will we have those kind of perspectives? Yes. The- yes. So, so okay. again, this is, it's always very valuable to, to remind folks that anytime you're dealing in a, with an event, that has something to do with the sun, please do not look at this directly. It's, yes. it's like an eclipse in the sense that you don't want to look at it directly. You don't want to point a telescope at the sun. Right? All those kinds oh. of same cautions that would happen during an eclipse we're also going to talk about during this transit. So, right. so basically just oh. let the pros do it. Which is us. Good, in, so you good information. <laughs> don't look at the sun one more time. Well, yeah, please don't. Please it. don't look at the sun directly. But we do have uh, we have special filters on our telescope that make it safe to observe this kind of an event. And when you're observing that event uh, with with special filters, what you see is you see kind of a, an orangish glow to the surface of the sun. You might see some texturing on the surface of the sun. Those are basically the sun is kind of like a big pan of boiling water. It's kind of like convection cells. Gases are rising, gases are sinking. Sure. Uh, the hotter gases are, that are rising, they, they rise up and then they cool off and then they sink again. Well, that makes a difference on how they look as well. So, so the hotter gases are actually a little bit brighter. The cooler gases are a little bit fainter. And, and so when you look at it, you'll see that dark ball against the face of the sun. Right. Now, now the, the thing that's important about transits is they're historically important. Right. They're not so much that we're doing current science on them now, although 150 years ago, there was still a lot to be learned by one of these events. That, and, that, just to interrupt just for a second, it just seems like uh, back in the day, this would have been the major thing they were focusing yeah. on, is to get to see the, one of the planets in the solar system in some way, get to see that that, uh, that planet. So yeah. that's got to be a big deal even back then. Right. So if, if you think back to, the say, the mid-1800s, all right. In the mid 1800s, we didn't have a perfect idea of exactly how far away the sun was, or in other words, our orbital radius of the Earth. We we had numbers; they were semi close to what they are today, but they were not refined. And so, to get better numbers, mm-hmm. the scientists actually sent out expeditions all over the world to watch one of these events from multiple locations. Because the reason you do that, you would do that and time everything with a very high precision because then you could triangulate the angle of, of the planets, planet Mercury against the face of the sun from two locations on the earth. Right. And with that triangulation, then you could actually do the geometry to figure out how far away the, you could the sun get the was, distance right? more accurately. Yeah, yes. That you, sounds you, like you a get the idea. distance to the planet, which then tells you that helps tell you the distance to the sun. So, okay. so, so what we're looking at right here with this image, this is actually a picture of a team from the United States Naval Observatory. They are all packing their equipment and they're getting ready to head out to uh, to South America to observe the 1874 transit of Venus. That is a very cool picture. And, the, and again, just the fact that that's going on mm-hmm. at that time back then. We yep. were, were involved in a lot of other things around the planet, and especially in this country, and things about to happen. But here's a group of scientists actually going out and mm-hmm. getting that information that we're going to need as we move forward. Exactly right. Now, the, the U.S. Naval Observatory, of course, that's our that's one of our government's observatories. Actually, the the current structure of the U.S. Naval Observatory today in Washington D.C. D.C. is the home residence of the vice president. So. That's, that's the vice president's official house. They live in the U.S. Naval Observatory. But the observatory hmm. is not just a, you know, it's not just a nice name for a house. It actually is an institution 
established by the federal government to do a lot of things. But one of the big things that the U.S. Naval Observatory is focused on is very precise locations of stars and planets in the sky. Part of the reason that they're so interested in that is for the purpose of navigation. And, okay. in, and even still today, we're, we, we calibrate our GPS systems based on our knowledge of the, the locations of the stars. So we use the stars to be able to calibrate our GPS systems. Well, okay. th that means the more accurately that we can know the positions of the stars, the more accurately we can calibrate GPS. So even today, the U.S. Naval Observatory is carrying out not transit observations, but observations that are giving us a better idea of the uh, of higher and higher precision locations for stars and planets in the sky. So we can nail down orbits, we can nail down the location of the sun relative to the earth, and we can nail down the locations of stars in the sky relative to each other so that we can then use the, those high, highly accurate positions to calibrate our GPS systems, which helps us know our locations here on the Earth. Wow, that is uh, that that's pretty amazing, and and uh, you know that is science really working at a high level mm -hmm. and informing uh, us in so many different ways. I guess those stars are. Wait a minute. Uh, it seems like I remember a show where you there was a red shift and these stars are moving. I was thinking for a second there, we had those stars just in a fixed location, and that's going to give us the information, and we're done, right? <laughs> Wrong, okay? But, but it gives us a lot more accurate information. It does, it does. And so, so even though the stars are moving some, their, um, their motions within the galaxy relative to just the daily motion of the Earth or even, even a year on the planet Earth, uh, th that's actually relatively small. So, so okay. we do track the motions. We call those proper motions of stars within the Milky Way relative to each other. But, but again, that uh, in terms of the angular change per day is a whole lot smaller than just our, the change of our position because we're rotating around the Earth or we're orbiting around the sun. So we talked about transits of Mercury and transits of Venus. It turns out that back, uh, back in 2012... Okay. There was a transit of Venus, and we have an image from the transit of Venus here. This is actually an image taken by the team from the Space Science Center. Oh, right. From right, a place called the Gobi Desert. Oh, oh, just, uh, is that in Alabama? It's actually in Lower Mongolia. But okay, there we just, go. You, you <laughs> go to Al just a little bit. Oh, you go to Alabama, you take a left, you know, and you, and you travel for a really long ways to the other side of the earth. And then, okay, thank you. <laughs> you drop down from China a little ways, and it, yeah, there you go. You find uh, yourself in a very dry place. That's thank you the for orienting me now. That's I think I know. <laughs> All right, that sounded like a great trip, though, yeah. especially for students to t take out to that. Oh, that's got to be fantastic. It's a really, it was a really neat expedition, and and again, the the whole purpose of this was not so much to do science, but just to share the event with uh, with the public. Our team at Space Science Center actually collaborated with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to be able to show the the world this event so we were taking these pictures from Gobi and we were webcasting them as part of NASA's overall education uh, effort to just let people around the world share in this event sure. we, we had 1.4 million people log on to our web servers oh, that that's, day that's good and watch that, that event with really us. so good. that was really cool yeah, well, this is a wonderful picture. Tell us a little bit about this. Uh, and uh, did it go across? I, I, I'm also wondering now. They're not. These plants are not going to go in a particularly um, uh, horizontal right. track. They're that's going right. to be on their own orbit around the sun anyway, and that's what we're going to see. Yep, that's exactly right. So when the when the Venus transit happened, relative to the way the image is aligned here, you can see that black dot, which is over on the left hand side. Sure, that's Venus. That's Venus being closer than the sun by quite a lot, right? So it looks looks fairly large relative to the sun, but really, if Venus was at the distance of the sun, it would shrink down to a little tiny dot. Okay, yeah, because so, I was thinking that sun still is big, though. That's very sun, big. Sun's a lot bigger, but, but, but relative to the distance, it would be even bigger than Venus if Venus was at that same distance. Right. So the direction it traveled, though, during this transit would have been vertically kind of up and down. So wow. as you're looking okay. at this image, imagine, you know, this is Venus about halfway through the transit. It would have started at the upper left and gone through the sun down to the lower left. Okay. Right? So it's almost okay. on a vertical line as it traveled across this particular image right Wow, here. That, that's, uh, I don't understand that exactly. Well, um, par part of that's just the way our cameras were aligned. But, but really, it's, it's all, all the planets are moving around the sun in, a, in the same plane 
and in the same direction. And so Venus is doing that same thing, but just relative to the way we had our cameras aligned, because remember the sun also rises and then as the sun goes across the sky, it kind of tips over like this. So it depends on what time of day you're observing. Oh, it depends okay. on how your okay. telescopes are set up, whether they track that change in orientation or not. And, and then it, it depends on whether you know Venus was going to go across the just the edge of the sun or the middle of the sun, and all of that's the geometry of the orbits that so are taking all place. All that geometry plays a part right. in it. Well, that's now right. take a look at this. this is the picture, another picture you brought, and that kind of tells us from where it was to where it is at this moment. Exactly, you can see it's moving along that vertical line. This is when the event was almost over. It's almost to the bottom of the sun where it was going to move off, but the bottom would have actually been the the right hand side if you were just standing on the ground looking up at the sun. Another interesting thing when you look at that image, if you yeah. see all those big white areas on there, those were all gigantic storms, right? And so so the sun is very, very active uh, during this particular time. It had lots of sunspot groups. Those sunspot groups are also in the plane of orbit. So, so the plane of the orbit is really kind of up right. and down in this particular picture. The picture is kind of sideways. But you can see those sunspot groups in those big areas. Everywhere that you see on that image that's white right. is hot. Everywhere you see on the image that's dark is cool. So obviously Venus is a lot cooler than the rest of the surface of the sun. Sure. So, But the interesting thing is this. Those areas that are white are in the millions of degrees Celsius. The rest of the sun is somewhere around 6,000 degrees Celsius. So those were gigantic areas of what we call um, disturbance on the sun. They're big sunstorms. Uh, they're, they're gigantic areas where the sun... Um, because of the twisting of its magnetic field, which occurs every 11 years, it gets very active on the surface and it breaks out in spots. We know those as sunspots. And then sometimes those sunspots will erupt uh, in those giant white hot storms right there. And those are solar flares. So these are, these are active regions on the sun, which are actually emitting solar flares. Uh, they're shooting out material out into the solar system. So you can see some of those hot spots. Uh, and activity right there on those same images where we captured the transit of Venus back pretty, in 2012. Pretty nice, and it's amazing you can do that. You must have a huge density filter. We talk on the on the cameras sometimes about neutral density because yeah. we, we, we have to regulate and control the light coming into the camera lens. Right. Wow, you have to have one for the sun, do you not? So, so imagine <laughs> a neutral density filter that blocked out all the wavelengths of light except one little gap. And in that one little gap, it lets, it lets the light come through. And when you choose that gap for a, for a line, for, for, a, for a color of light that comes from a specific element, right. then you can figure out what that element is doing on the sun. Those pictures, those red pictures were hydrogen alpha pictures. We also okay. have some purple ones up there. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look at that. Hold on. Yeah. I'll pull them up for us. There we go. So here we go. This is a very different looking shot it's different in color but it's but it's mm -hmm. different on purpose so what we've done here is we've let a different color of light right there at the near ultraviolet actually right okay uh you know very very purple part of the spectrum and and into the near ultraviolet those are um those are calcium images so the element calcium is actually in the atmosphere of the sun and what we've done is we've let a little bit of light come through right at the wavelength where calcium likes to emit actually there's a couple of wavelengths uh, calcium H and K lines, but mm -hmm. but everything else is as you mentioned the neutral density filter. We blocked out all the other Everything's all gone, the other yeah. colors of light except just those colors coming from calcium, and that's responsible for those little purple dots in the white where all the, all that high temperature is. Yeah, there. again the the white areas here are hot, the the darker areas are cool. But now we're seeing what calcium gas is doing as compared to hydrogen gas, which is what the other image. So so right. on the sun we can we can take the temperature of different flavors of gas so to speak and that helps mm -hmm. us get an idea of the structure of the sun that that wow. that tells us you know what's happening at different atmospheric layers at different altitudes above the surface of the sun so it's interesting yeah it, it really is interesting and and um you know i just want to reference uh your appearance on the t um, talk with mike and tom's show and boy was that an education for certainly for tom now i don't know <laughs> yeah I, I, me too but uh but it was real interesting you talked about the sun and how people have just the wrong idea of what it does and call it a ball of fire i think that that's right. that's kind of a button for you i believe right it's i mean like, it's, I, I think it's just a misconception that i like to help people uh, disabuse themselves of. So. There we go. Very, very nicely put, <laughs> by the way. I, I like it. 
Yeah, man. So um, you're gonna you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna you're gonna put that neutral density uh, filter on there. Uh, you're gonna uh, shrink it down to that one or two uh, uh, openings there for right. the light to come through, and then uh, you guys are gonna record that. That's for the right. Entire time. And so so when people log onto the webcast, they'll see either kind of an orangish image, which will be that hydrogen gas image, sorry, that's or they'll me see looking up again. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no worries. <laughs> or they'll see this kind of purple image, which is a calcium image. We'll have both of those going on the day of the transit on November 11th. And again, if you're if you're seeing this from the archive, you go back and pull up those images right there. All right, that's that sounds really good. I, I'm uh, I'm always curious about these things in these events, and sometimes mm -hmm. I just don't know. So it sounds like it's a good thing that maybe, particularly for in our area, that we pay attention to what you guys are doing down at the Coca Cola Space Science Center. And I'm sure you have a schedule up, right? And you can go to our website. Our website, which is www. Yes. I still type the W's. Yes. That, well, that, that <laughs> I'm one of those guys. No, you're so. not. You you got to get cooler than that. Uh, I skip the WW, but that's okay. Usually, I'm with you usually the W's are just like a they're like a T up for the rest of the website coming. All right, you so know. I think just getting your think attention we'll, to say, oh, there's going to be some letters coming. I think I better pay attention. All right, we're going to have to bring another expert in here to figure this out. But I think we've moved so far. At least the computing power has moved so far. We may not need those, but it sure is fun to hear people say. Them. There you all go. Right, there we so go. the rest of the address is CC. SSC, Charlie Charlie Sam Sam Charlie dot org. CCSSC, which is just the initials for Coca Cola Space Science Center. Got it. CCSSC.org. Find out all the transit stuff on that website. Well, I think people need to go there, uh, see what you guys are up to. Go down and visit. It's yeah. an amazing place to be uh, and just see. And you guys give tours. You're not just walk okay. in and look around. No, somebody will tell you what's going on in that place. And I, it's a, a great learning experience for everyone. So you got to do that. And you run it in a great way. You do a lot of work down there. Um, all right, man. So uh, we're we're looking at this transit coming through. What else is happening? Well, so so transits. Transits are a great topic transits, anyway, right? Transits 150 years ago, again, back in the mid to late 1800s, were teaching us a lot about our own solar system. Right. But we've, we've gotten most of the knowledge that we've gotten from transits, uh, mo most of the useful things we can learn from transits. We've already figured that stuff out. Right. That included, by the way, the composition of Venus's atmosphere, which is another thing that could be tested during a transit. But, oh, okay. But now in the space okay. age, we've actually sent spacecraft to Venus we visited there, so we've done direct sampling. So there's a lot of those kinds of things that were useful during transits in our own solar system. They're not as useful now. So transits are kind of a curiosity. Right, because you've we've actually sent some uh, some spacecraft yep. to those, including Mercury. Been to Mercury. Been to Mercury. That's, that's the messenger spacecraft. I like the way you say that. Hey, yeah, just been to Mercury. Been there, now, done okay. that. <laughs> we've, been, we've been to Venus with various spacecraft as well. So, so again, we've gotten direct samples of those things. Sure. But that's in our own solar system. Yeah. I'm, uh, okay. So the transits that are still interesting to us here in 2019 are the ones that are taking place in other solar systems. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Yes. That implies something, right? Yes, it does. That implies that there are actually planets around other stars. And in fact, the very way we discovered planets around other stars had to do with the way that the planets were orbiting around those parent stars. Right. And so there's a whole new class of planets that we know a lot about now yes. that are called extrasolar planets. Extrasolar planet. Extrasolar. Extrasolar means they're not orbiting our sun. They're orbiting another star. All right. We now know of over 4,000 extrasolar planets. Wait a minute. 4,000. Over 4,000. And over by the way, 4, that number keeps going up. So it's a little bit hard for me to keep track. I think the, <laughs> I think the latest number I saw was 4,084 known confirmed exoplanets or extrasolar planets. Incredible. And so, so by the way, let me just let me throw that shortening in. Yes. You'll, you'll see the word exoplanet. Right. And exoplanet is just because guys like myself got tired of saying extrasolar planet. It was just too many syllables. Yeah. So we just cut it down to exoplanet. Shorten it up. Make it quick. <laughs> and we're moving go. on. Okay, I got it. In with a cool crowd. So if you're <laughs> in with a cool crowd, you'll call them exoplanets. So when you hear the term exoplanet, just think about a planet around a star that's not the sun. It's around another one of those stars that we see up in the sky. First now, of all, that's just amazing that we have that technology. Right. And, and, and uh, yeah, it's sort of brilliant scientific thinking to figure this out. Well, I think, and, that's, and that's what I'd like to address a little bit. How did we find these things? 
galaxies, right? Yeah. There's two, there's two ways that we found exoplanets. And actually, the first way is a little bit more complicated. It's a pretty, pretty specialized circumstance. Okay. That's when a very big, massive planet is orbiting a fairly small star at a fairly close range. Right. When that's happening, scientists can actually detect the star moving in and out relative to the Earth. But really what it's doing, it's kind of going around in a circle. Now, we don't see that other planet, but we can see the star moving in a circle. Well, that implies that there has to be another planet out there tugging it and making it move. Okay. The planet does not give off light, so it's not bright oh, enough for right. us to see. Yes, I remember you saying, hey, right. it's all about light. Right. That's Astronomy's prejudiced to things that glow in the dark, so that's why we have to watch <laughs> those things that glow in the dark, right? So, so the star itself, though, is glowing nicely, and we can see that star moving around in its own little circle because of a common orbit with a with a very heavy planet. But to us, what we're measuring is we're measuring the radial movement in and out. And we do that with this thing called Doppler shifts or red shift, blue shift. And and so that's the that's the wavelengths of light being shifted relative to be, because of the motion of that star. So so one one of the ways we can figure out that there are planets around other stars is we can just see that planet that star rather we can see that star that parent star vibrating in and out a little bit which really means it's going around in tiny circles. Got okay. It. Yeah. But okay, there are only cool. a very special few um, star planet combinations that are just right for us to detect that kind of radial motion. Well, and it's at such a distance too. And exactly. It's, it's still a uh, mind boggling and for me anyway that we can take those tiny little shifts and things and then extrapolate that that's an orbit. That's right. Uh, that's right. Pretty exactly. Cool idea. But so so Astronomers came up with then a second way to potentially identify planets that are orbiting other stars. Okay. And this still is kind of a Goldilocks situation where everything has to be lined up just right. Got it. It's just that it's a more common occurrence, which is right. something called a transiting exoplanet. So we've talked about transits. Okay. Transits in our own solar system are a planet moving in, the, in front of the face of a sun. Well, a transiting exoplanet is another solar system out in our galaxy where the planet's planes of orbit are lined up just right to where the planet will pass in front of the face of its parent star. Okay. And it, when it does that, it dims the light from that parent star down a little bit. Okay. And then as it moves off the surface off the face of the of its parent star, the light comes back up again. So so it's just passing between us. It's not actually touching the star, but right. it's passing in between us and that star. It drops the light coming to Earth down a little bit as it moves in front, and then as it moves out of the way, the light comes back up again. So, right. so scientists d developed a whole series of cameras that were very sensitive to picking up these slight variations in the light coming from stars due to planets passing in front of them. Yeah. And they mounted some of those cameras on a couple of spacecraft. The, okay. first, the first spacecraft to go into orbit around the Earth um, that had this technology on it was called Kepler. Wow. And so Kepler, Kepler was a, a, a telescope uh, named after Johannes Kepler, who studied planetary motions, by the way. So, so Kepler was a telescope that was specifically designed to watch thousands and thousands of stars, photograph them over and over and over, compare those images then from night to night, and see if this dimming of light was taking place. Okay. When Kepler then identified stars that were dimming, they would go back and do follow-up observations of those specific stars to see if they could more carefully measure the dimming of that starlight. Okay. And with that technology, Kepler was able to identify literally thousands of candidates for planets orbiting other stars. So then that, that information is given to the astronomy community on the surface of the Earth. Those astronomers then begin to watch those star systems, and then they right. can identify those planets very carefully and figure out the characteristics. How big is the planet? How, how long does it take to move in front of the star? Therefore, how far away from its parent star is it? All those kinds of things. Well, they give you that information so they, they, you said follow-up, so everyone can start to follow up. And exactly. Then, then, then see what the distances are and see if there are other planets there, but yeah. not just the one you see. That So this Kepler... Um, telescope sounds um, like an amazing piece of equipment. It, and, it, and it was. So, so the Kepler telescope s spent several years in, in service, and it is now, uh, it is now defunct. Okay, <laughs> it's, all right. Its cameras quit working. But, but in the process, though, Kepler, we, we went from knowing about a, a dozen or so exoplanets 
to literally knowing about thousands of right. exoplanets, all because of the data coming from the Kepler Space Telescope. Mm. But if you can imagine the process I just described, it kind of had a, a prejudice, a selection mm -hmm. effect is what we call it in oh, science. Okay. Its selection effect was it tended to find big planets around other stars. And that's because it was looking for stars that were dimming down. Well, obviously, the bigger the planet is, the more the starlight will dim down as the planet moves in front of the face of the sun or of that uh, face uh, of that right. other star. Right. So so Kepler's, Kepler's exoplanets that I, it identified were pre-selected to be big ones. Yes. So... So those planets wouldn't be capable of supporting what we would call life as we know it, right? Yes. Think of them as like mega Jupiters, right? right? So, right. so Jupiter's already impossible for us to live on. It's a gas giant. Gravity is way too strong, all that stuff. Right, okay. So, so think about something that's you know 10 to 100 times the size of Jupiter. So There's not going to be life on something like yeah, that, it, generally it, speaking. It, it's, it's, not, it's not a perfect situation for what we know as life here on Earth, which is... Uh, something that is uh, carbon-based, something that lives with you know, liquid water and lives on liquid water and things like that. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking for the kind of life that we understand, sure. it's better for us to look for planets that are about the same size and about the same distance away from their parent star as the Earth is. Or in other words, they're about the right distance from their parent star where liquid water could potentially exist on the surface. That sounds like a very difficult thing to, uh, to measure. You're, you're really uh, trying to look at that parent star for that planet and measure the distance in the Goldilocks zone yeah, that you were right. talking about. Um, I just don't understand the math that get behind that, <laughs> so well, I won't I, even try. <laughs> but I can, give you a, I can give you a quick preview, which is this. One of the reasons that that telescope got named Kepler is because Johannes Kepler back in the 1600s, actually did something very brilliant. He figured out that the period of time it takes for a planet to go around the sun is related to how far away it is. Now, that, that doesn't sound that amazing. It's like, okay, well, the, lo the farther it is away, the longer it takes to go around. I get it. But no, it, with, with Kepler's law, and this is Kepler's okay. third law, it related it exactly in a mathematical way. So if you could figure out the period of the orbit, you could actually figure out exactly how far away it was from the parent star. Okay. And so so we can we can apply Kepler's third law, which he applied to our own planets in our own solar system. We can apply that to these exoplanets. So if we see the same planet move in front of that star a couple of times, we know the period of its orbit. And if we know the period of its orbit, and the mass of the parent star, which we have other ways to figure that out. Right, right. Then we can figure out exactly how far away it is. Oh, okay. If we can figure out that how far like... away it is, then we can figure out whether or not it's in the Goldilocks zone. Right. That because just we know not ours. too hot, not okay. too cold, just right <laughs> for water to exist on the surface, right? Right. So, so all right. So, so, so you got, let me just say, let's see if I'm following this. You got Kepler out there, mm -hmm. this great telescope. He's, uh, this telescope is finding these giant planets passing in front of these smaller suns. That's right. Of theirs, and now the next step is to look at a planet that has is uh, maybe connected because if our solar system has not eight planets. Okay. Uh, uh, anyway, that the uh, that the generally the idea is there are going to be other planets with it too, and then yeah. certainly if that planet you can uh, find is going to be within that Goldilocks zone, mm -hmm. then we're golden, and we've got a planet that may support life. Right. So, wow. so in order to find those Earth-like planets that are just that right distance away from big bigger stars, being all more like the Earth situation. We needed a telescope that had just a lot better resolution than Kepler had. Right. And so that's what really was required. So NASA then developed a brand new spacecraft okay. called TESS. All right. And TESS is a spacecraft that is the, the, the TESS is an acronym. It's okay. it stands for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Okay, so they went right at it. What, they went they right were trying at to it. Yes. get the information they needed and named it uh, the same. Exactly. Right, so it. so with, with TESS, or the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, NASA developed a spacecraft that was better suited for high-resolution imaging of very right. minute variations in star brightness to find these Earth-like planets around stars capable of supporting life. Right. And so now that TESS has come online, the expectation... This is, TESS has only been up there for a very short time, by the way. Right. So, so TESS is actually expected to identify 
maybe as many as 20,000 new exoplanets. And among that group of 20,000 new exoplanets, a, a, a substantially large number, yet unknown, but substantially large number of Earth-sized planets, Earths or super-Earths, which means something, something that's Earth-sized or a little bit bigger, not, not the size of Jupiter, but just a right. little bit bigger. So, so when TESS begins to return data, which it already has, mm -hmm. and when we get that full catalog of TESS-identified exoplanets, right. we're going to have a lot better idea of what planets are out there capable of supporting life because they're in their Goldilocks zone of their own parent star and they're closer to the gravitational conditions of, the, of our own Earth. All right, that sounds wonderful, first of all, because I, I, I mean, my first thought is, hey, we need to target those and maybe send them one of those... Uh, you know, albums that we made yeah. <laughs> back in the day. But but uh, let's send some information or target some radio waves or something there to say, hey, guys, we're out here. Let's yeah. uh, <laughs> let's get to know each other. Well, and, and so so Stephen Hawking might disagree with you. Okay, actually. there we go. Stephen Hawking actually wrote, he said, you know, it's probably better that we listen rather than talk at this point. Oh, We want to listen to see who's out there first before we start talking to them and letting them know we're here. Listen, I know exactly what he's saying there because I've seen all the Alien movies yeah. and all those other things that are out there they're not maybe not friendly enough to us it doesn't usually go listen, well at no? least in those in those stories it doesn't seem to go well for us <laughs> no but that that is that is very cool so we are really cataloging um the these exoplanets that uh are in that goldilocks zone the right size right distance from their uh sun and uh that's going to be a lot of information to have to work with, and, and it's probably yeah. going to lead us in a lot of other different directions as well. It's really going to keep uh, a lot of planetary or exoplanetary scientists busy for a while, trying mm -hmm. to sort through all that test data, figuring out which are the best candidates. But, but already, efforts have begun, coordinated with these exoplanet satellites, right? And SETI, which is the search for, search for extraterrestrial life, exactly. where SETI is, is uh, coordinating with the catalogs of these identified exoplanets to begin listening to them specifically. So the more and more okay, Earth-like yeah, they are, what, yeah. the better Makes candidates sense. they are for supporting life, the more SETI wants to, to focus in on those known planets uh, Absolutely. around other stars and listen there, right? Well, so, well, yeah, it's a giant universe, it turns out. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. we might as well narrow that down. Right, and so, but that, but that, it's exciting that we live in a time where that collaboration has already begun. And again, I point back to what I said at the first of the show. Yeah. 150 years ago, when, when scientists were trendling off to these Mercury transits and Venus transits, right. we were still trying to figure out how far our own sun was away, <laughs> right? Yes. And that just wasn't that long ago. So a couple of lifetime spans ago, we didn't know how far away the sun was. Today, we're actually identifying Earth-like planets around other stars and listening to them with radio telescopes to see whether or not they're, they're transmitting you know, in, in, a... intelligent life on those planets, which, which to me is a, a, it's just a, an amazing jump forward, both technologically speaking, but also in our capability of understanding and exploring our near-universe environment. Wow, it uh, it's too much to take in. It seems like maybe, but uh, it's a it's a good thing to take in, and I think the science and and astronomy. I mean, good gracious, you guys are uh, looking at all of these wonderful things in the sky and kind of relating them back, and we're understanding more and more now, and it'll help us make uh, better decisions about where we put our money and all of those kind of things in our uh, economies and and other kinds of things. Well, it's pretty amazing that uh, we get to see this uh, transit of Mercury coming up, all right? And that's November the 11th. That's right, that's November right. the 11th. It's basically all morning, uh, Eastern Standard Time. It's from about 7.35 in the morning. It's going to wrap up about 1.05 p.m. or so, 1.04 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, so, so that again, all times are Eastern Eastern Standard Time. Correct. Uh, yes. Here on the east that. coast of the United States of America. There we are. And we, we'll uh, we'll hope for good weather too. So, We're hoping. Uh, <laughs> but that's on. but you guys have got the equipment down there. So uh, you're going to uh, record this best, and you probably are going to connect. If I know you, connect with these other centers and have information from other sites as well to kind of help with your feed, even if we have cloudy weather. Yeah, there'll be lots of uh, people all across the United States who are webcasting the same event and. 
And so, yeah, we're, we're hoping that they have good weather too. So in case we don't, they do, you know, all yeah, that kind of thing. To, so yeah, we, that's, that's it. Weather's kind of unpredictable <laughs> sometimes around here. So. The big thing for us on this event is we just want people to have that chance to just observe it, enjoy it, and and maybe think about how far we've come in that last 150 years. Well, you know, I, I, I think about it in, in one other way too. Is that we Mercury doesn't um, – doesn't have a Facebook profile. It doesn't have popularity. It just doesn't. You don't hear much about Mercury. So I'm I'm kind of glad that Mercury's getting a spotlight a little bit. So so what? A little bit more about Mercury before we go, Sean. Yeah, sure. So uh, what what do we know about Mercury and the size of it? It's it's the closest to the sun. Mm-hmm. It's got to be hot and uh, just about. Uh, made of iron or something uh, right. if it gets that close to the So, uh, to so the two sun. things about Tell Mercury. About w- one of the things is exactly what you described. It, it tends to be very hot because it's very close to the sun. Sure. But that's hot on one side. Okay. Mercury doesn't have much of an atmosphere to speak of. So it doesn't have an insulation layer. So what happens is that Mercury actually rotates about, it, it's a slow rotator. It rotates about every 56 days. Okay. So when the when the backside of Mercury though that's facing away from the sun has been out of the sun a while, it gets very very cold. So not only is Mercury one of the hottest places in the solar system, oh no, you're not going to the side me facing the of... sun, the side facing away from the sun is actually one of the coldest places oh, all right. in the solar system, which is just a really weird. I cannot. I'm not. Uh, I'm not working with that equation. Just yet. it's too, <laughs> hot, too close to the sun, but the sun, side away from the sun is one of the coldest. Yeah. Okay. Be- because of that lack that of atmosphere, there's a gigantic difference between sun and shade. Okay. Right? All right. There's there just it is. nothing to hold the heat in. So once once that side of the planet's facing away from the sun, it radiates off all the heat that it's stored up pretty quickly, and then it it just gets very very cold, and it doesn't see then the the other side of the uh, of the sun. Where, I'm sorry, it doesn't see the other side of its orbit where it's facing the sun for a for a big number of days. So it it has a lot of time to cool off. Okay, so it does get around to facing eventually. The sun. Yes. Eventually, okay. it'll face back around to the sun and get hot again. But but it's just a planet of extremes, and that's kind of I think yeah. I think if you ask a, a typical school student, hey, is Mercury hot or cold? They're gonna say hot. It's right. close to the sun. It's really hot. Sure. Which is not incorrect, but it's just not the whole story. The story is it's also very very cold on the far side. So not right. only does Mercury not have an atmosphere. It it also um, it also is a, a very scarred world, right? Because it didn't have an atmosphere to slow down meteors impacting it, so it's got craters all over it. Looks a whole lot like the moon. If you saw a picture of Mercury and a picture of the moon, you might have tr- a little trouble telling which mm-hmm. one was which, mm-hmm. depending on how those pictures were taken, because it's just a it's an airless world covered with craters. Um, wow. You you mentioned a, a little while ago that Mercury is largely made out of iron. That's also true. That's probably because Mercury at one time was a much larger planet. Oh. It suffered a major impact in the early history of our solar system, which tore off a lot of its, what we would call the crust and mantle. Right. And left a little bit of mantle and a big iron core down in the center of Mercury, which was once a larger planet. Right. So, so a That's really wild. interesting phenomenon about Mercury. It's, it's, got a, it, it's very, very dense because it has this very large iron core. So, okay. so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of an oddball planet. Bob? Yeah, it, it, seem, it seems like it. But what you just mentioned, I mean, I, that, uh, I recall back, uh, we're talking about how the moon was formed at some point mm-hmm. because there might have been a collision with Earth. Yes. That, uh, and uh, now that happened throughout the solar system. It really did. You got hit. Everybody gets hit in the solar system here. Exactly. So, so another interesting thing, we were talking about Venus a little bit earlier. Venus is also rotating backwards very, very slowly. Well, why would that be true? Well, it probably suffered a large impact as well. The, uh-huh. the planet Uranus, is, is, its rotation axis is tipped over on its side. How did that happen? Well, it probably suffered a very large impact too. right? So, so the more we look in detail at our solar system, the more it's pretty clear that impacts, and not just like small ones, but actually right. really large, uh, devastating impacts yes. were the history of almost every planet and every moon in our entire solar system.
All right. That's, um, that's good that we know that. That's also scary that there's probably an asteroid out there with our name on it. I know we've talked about that before in the past, yeah, but yeah. maybe in the future we'll get to talk about that right, one again. But uh, I want to make sure that uh, we're okay here. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for uh, being with us today and talking about this uh, big event coming up next week. Hope you'll continue to come in and enlighten us on some of this information that, you know, it doesn't get front page news sometimes. Occasionally it's you true. might miss this and some people are like myself are out there very interested in in all of this phenomenon so i want to be there when it happens and if i hear about it late i'm like oh no oh, should have called sean uh, <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for the opportunity to be here it was, it's fun and i hope folks can join us on the webcast hey sean thanks a lot we'll see you next time all right thanks